Aloha and welcome to another episode of Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host, Matt Johnson, here with Justina Spiritu, just like every Thursday <laughs> afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, as always, please join the conversation uh, on Twitter at ThinkTechHI. And uh, Justine, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest today. Yes, thank you, Matt. So we are lucky today to have Ashley Lukens, who is the program director for the Hawaii Center for Food Safety. So as we like to kind of discuss on the show, there's so many different roles and skills and people that are behind making our food system in Hawaii a more sustainable and productive and exciting place. So Ashley has a long history of work here in Hawaii focusing on food and also has a diverse background in a number of different areas. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Ashley. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, I also have a background in independent media, so oh, wow. I'm we about did. it. We're learning <laughs> about a different type of thing about you. Okay. Totally. Perfect. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, awesome. So why don't we start with... Um, so Center for Food Safety opened uh, here in Hawaii just two years ago, and you kind of started that program. Why don't you kind of describe your position and the, the role the Center for Food Safety or their kind of mission and how that came to establish an office here in Hawaii? Cool. So CFS was the brainchild of a long time sort of anti-globalization and food activist, Andrew Kimbrell. Um, and he realized that there wasn't anybody working at the intersection of ag and the environment. Mm -hmm. And industrial agriculture is one of the primary drivers of some of the environmental problems that we all really fear. Climate change, habitat loss, water degradation, um, the sort of incarceration and torturing of animals. And he thought, rather than work on those issues in a silo, mm -hmm. why don't we try to change the food system mm -hmm. and bring about a system that actually promotes the environment rather than hurt it? Um, they, their first kind of weapon was legal work. So we're primarily a law firm. Okay. Um, and we do really sexy things like defend counties like Kauai, Maui, mm. and Hawaii Island uh, in their lawsuits against large-scale agrochemical companies. But we also do really boring things like file comments on regulatory rule changes. Mm. Um, and as sort of the movement to regulate chemical companies in Hawaii ramped up here, um, Andy realized we needed an office. Um, and that's when he found me. Um, and I was what I like to call a recreational lobbyist at the legislature. Like most people, I wasn't paid. I went down there. I advocated for bills that were important to me. I was really interested in uh, it, it, supporting a local food system. And Andy and I kind of combined our superpowers and we've been trying to do something here that leverages the national resources that CFS brings to bear but also complements and builds capacity within all of the different sort of sub movements in Hawaii's broader food movement. Yeah. And so that kind of seems like one is the legislation uh, kind of focused on food, but what you talk about that kind mm. of capacity building, it's it's almost a whole different arena. So you really yeah. guys are are taking on a lot. And so kind of what specifically, what kind of projects or programs do you run to kind of cultivate that? Yeah. So we've got a program called Building Power, um, and the idea, I, at least from where I'm sitting, and and I come at this as a political scientist, so. What are the ingredients to social change? It's like the academic question. Um, well, you need people that are informed, mm -hmm. um, but you need people that are empowered, that believe that they have the capacity to affect change. And then you need to give them access to those change-making opportunities. And so building power really tries to work on all three of those. So we provide educational opportunities to anybody in Hawaii who's interested in issues related to food and the environment. And we normally do this through speaker series or online webinars. Um, and then we do trainings. Like if you want to know about how to be an effective public speaker, mm -hmm. we offer trainings that are open to activists. If you want to know how to lobby at the ledge, we offer trainings to activists. Um, so we're trying to both inform them and empower them. And then we have this you know, sort of social media and email focused alert system mm -hmm. that says, if there are opportunities for you to engage and use your voice, we're going to let you know. Mm -hmm. Like, plug into us. Because a lot of peop times people are like, I had no idea right. that that was going down at mm -hmm. the ledge. You know, and 
they're sneaky down there. Right. There's a lot. There's a lot to decipher. Just I mean, the language totally. of legislation and then the timing of hearings and and that kind of. It's designed to be. Confusing. I think to sort of dampen participation mm -hmm. and our lack of participation serves corporate interests mm -hmm. you know I go into when I started this job I would go into a hearing and it would be me and the biotech lobbyist right, right? now it's me and like 30 different lobbyists wow. that, that, that different industry groups um, and sort of industrial ag interests have put in the room um, and all those people are paid, they have staff, they have resources to really be down there. And I'm lucky, I also have, mm. you know, staff and resources to do my job, but I am alone right. in that work. And that's why we just try to create opportunities for people to participate, you know, whether it's like lobbying for bills that allow for um, video testimony from the neighbor islands, mm -hmm. you know? So we wanna do the good government stuff too, yeah. um, not just food stuff. Um, so that, that's awesome to hear about how you're starting to have more organizations involved going down and lobbying. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, and, and you've done a great job of really getting yourself out there. Your name is starting to become well known. And can you talk about some of the specific things you guys have been working on? I know you said you mentioned been doing some work on the neighbor islands, mm -hmm. some of the issues over on Kauai, as well as Maui. Can you talk a little bit about, about those and, and what was kind of the, I guess, the centerpiece or the, the issues that you were addressing? Yeah, so I would say the movement around regulating chemical companies in Hawaii b begins long before me. Um, every, every day, citizens got together as the biotech industry sort of expanded their footprint here, mm -hmm. and they were asking questions. You know, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you growing? What are you spraying? Mm -hmm. um, and they were really met with, we don't need to tell you. We don't have to tell you. Right. So they reached out to their elected officials, mm -hmm. and the elected officials said, well, we'll try to figure out what you're up to. Um, and those elected officials were also met with, we're not going to tell you. You don't have a right to know. Mm -hmm. And so those same citizens groups passed ordinances in each of their counties, on Kauai, on Maui, and on Hawaii Island, mm -hmm. that were generally, if we're going to generalize about the ordinances, they are all three very different. Mm -hmm. They said, let's increase transparency and regulation around okay these operations. Mm -hmm. So I come into the picture after all of that grassroots organizing. Mm. I mean, Justine and I, I remember that, do you remember the day? I went on a tour of Monsanto as a neighborhood board member. Okay. And I think I was outside with a sign. Yeah, I she was outside <laughs> with like a gas mask on. Oh, wow. I don't think I had a mask. That wasn't that well, I, never, I, I never I, heard about that. I think I probably had like a sign with like a peace <laughs> sign and like a yeah. sunflower or something. But, like, like, nevertheless, uh, like... Please tell us more. <laughs> so I come into this after that hard work. And what we wanted to do as an organization, CFS, is say we have the legal capacity to defend counties who are trying to pass protections mm -hmm. that their citizens want to see in place, yeah. right? So it's the citizens that have driven this. CFS provides the legal work. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that I represent CFS in Hawaii, I have done a lot of the news interviews around that and also have served as our lobbyist mm -hmm. at the legislature. Mm -hmm. But none of this wouldn't have, would have happened without everyday people getting together and saying, let's use our government to do what it is designed to do, and that's protect us from industrial interests. I always tell people, you know, if you want to eat healthy, you want to avoid pesticides in your food, there are things you can do as an individual, mm -hmm. right? You can buy organic, you can know your farmer, mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing you can do if you live alongside a field mm -hmm. where restricted use pesticides are sprayed on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of government. Yeah. The purpose of government is to ensure that we're all protected, and so people, it lobbied their government, their government passed laws, and what CFS has done is defend those counties mm -hmm. in their litigation. And I think that's what's been interesting too for me. Like I think a lot of times, uh, Center for Food Safety is associated with, with anti-biotech, but there's also a lot more that goes on with that. You're talking about you know, um, proper use of pesticide spray, knowing what's being sprayed, just having that transparency that you're talking about. Mm. And I think that's something that a lot of there's a lot of confusion around with the biotech companies because there's a lot of different things happening other than just the concept right. of GMO itself. Mm. And that's why I think is interesting with you guys and what you're focusing on is is a lot of different things and trying to just be transparent neighbors, right. which sounds like is a large part of what you're trying to do. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a double moment, right? It's like we want to say no to what we need to say no to, but we really need to say yes to what we want. And I think one of the things that's a, a model for the world about Hawaii is that we have this amazing, historically rooted, indigenous local food system that provides us a pathway forward, um, a, a better food system that can feed people, that's good for the environment. Um, and we want to do both. We want to support that food system and help it re-emerge and support local farmers. But we also want to say that there are very real threats posed by a certain number of, agri of agrochemical interests here in the state. And they're not doing genetic engineering kind of writ large willy-nilly. It's not like a drought-resistant crop variety. Mm. It's not even a nutritionally fortified crop variety. What they do here, by and large, is herbicide-tolerant corn and soy. Mm. That's what they're doing. So they are, by uh, definition of the crops that they're testing and developing here, using high volumes of herbicides to demonstrate the virility of the seed varieties that they're testing here. So it, it, it's, it's, for me, it's not even an anti-GMO question. I mean, certainly there are a lot of people that um, are in the anti-GMO movement that are concerned about the technology, and we absolutely also need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But here in Hawaii, I feel the question first and foremost is, what is the application of the technology here on our land? Mm -hmm. And that's why when you look at who's engaged in GMO here, it's the world's largest chemical companies mm -hmm. who sell the herbicides that they're designing the crops to be resistant to. So I, I, I want to do both, but I also try to get really clear on the issue yeah. that it's like, to, to have this kind of philosophical com conversation about technologies and ag, right. and like tools in the toolkit, I'm down. Mm. As long as we also address what's really happening here. Yeah, you do hear that tools in the toolkit quite mm. often. That's quite a Yeah, it's sexy. Yeah, that yeah. yeah, sounds great. Yeah, it sounds benign, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and uh, certainly maybe it could be, mm. but we, every tool is a weapon if you use it right. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important that we just stick to the numbers. That's why we publish this. I mean, one of the things that we do is we're a think tank, right? Mm -hmm. So we have seven staff PhDs in the organization that work across the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they all came together and helped uh, publish a pesticide report that's really driven our work over the past two years. Okay. We're going to take a quick break and then get a little more information about the report and then hear a little more about Ashley. <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. Take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa. You'll really enjoy it. So come around. We'll see you then. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We're giving you the best tips and with our best health coach here. So, Viva Health Coach. Viva la comida saludable. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Yeah. Aloha and welcome back to Hawaii Food and Farmer Series, everyone's favorite part of their Thursday. I'm your co-host Justine Spiritu. This is Matthew Johnson. Today is a special day because we have Ashley Lukens, the program director of Hawaii Center for Food Safety. So we were just talking about all the weapons in our tool shed. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> and right. the whole tool shed now. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's even bigger. Yeah. Our tool warehouse. So <laughs> That's it. Nice here one, <laughs> glimpse into the tool shed. <laughs> so, okay, you're uh, coming from this uh, pesticide angle. Mm. Let's talk about you commissioned this report. So yeah. how, how did that kind of come about? What kind of information yeah. does that have in there and how has been sharing that information? Cool. Yeah, um, so I helped write it. And actually, the, for me, it was a personal journey. When I got involved in this issue, I, had it, I didn't really know why people were so... Uh, amped up mm. about the GMO in, uh, issue in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get sense of like, what is what data is out there? Mm. 
So we didn't do any primary research. It's all bringing together the publicly accessible data on the GE seed industry in the state of Hawaii, mm -hmm. what exactly they're doing here. It turns out to, to do experimental crop varieties, you have to register it with the USDA. Yeah. So we found out what crops they're growing, what they're testing, what they're genetically modifying the plants to do. Awesome. Wow. Um, the next thing we wanted to do was say, if we know that it's for herbicide-resistant corn and soy, and we think that that has pesticide use associated with it, what's the data on pesticide use, mm. right? And then finally, if we know that they're using more pesticides, which the data clearly shows, what does the science tell us about the health impacts mm. of pesticide exposure? Because so often we're told, like, the science is equivocal, like, the jury's out, we don't know if GMOs are dangerous. Mm -hmm. mm. Maybe, but the science on pesticide yeah. exposure is really clear. Mm -hmm. um, it's dangerous and it's particularly dangerous to young children, mm -hmm. um, to the developing fetus and pregnant women, and to farm workers. And farm workers not because, uh, because they're most frequently exposed. But I had this aha moment recently where I realized, well, what if you live next to a field mm. where these pesticides are sprayed every day? Right. Then the farm worker uh, research might actually also be important. Mm -hmm. because it can help you know what low-level, daily chronic exposure to pesticides, what the impacts of that kind of exposure are. Right. So is there, has the industry been here long enough? To, yeah, I know you said you didn't put, do any of that research mm. on your own now, but is, has it been here long enough that you, we can start to look at that, the yeah. workers? And so long-range epidemiological studies are a massive feat in the yeah. public health sector. Right. It takes bringing together med schools and research centers, and there it, that does not exist mm. around this area of expertise. You're talking about environmental and pediatric toxicology, right? right. Um, so no, we don't have the expertise or the institutions in place to do those studies mm -hmm. here, but I think everybody wants to see it, and I know that whatever power I have or the organization has or our movement has to demand those studies, we're doing it. Yeah. Um, and the government just published a joint fact-finding study, actually, for the island of Kauai, where they tried to sift through the data. And they made the very same policy recommendations that we've been making. Okay. You know, so we have to increase transparency. Mm -hmm. Doctors can't do their jobs if they don't know what pesticides are being sprayed. Because mm -hmm. it was on the island of Kauai where there was some issues with schools where children were getting sick in the school and they were trying to figure out what was happening. Totally. And so pesticide drift was one of the areas of concern. What was the results of that? I wasn't, yeah. I don't remember exactly what happened. Right, so Waimea Canyon Middle School was actually evacuated twice. Now, the teachers, the community in Waimea, mm. believe that it was pesticide drift. Okay. And there's even video that the teacher shot the day of the evacuation mm. of the field right next to the school being sprayed. Wow. Um, but the Department of Agriculture, uh, in, upon investigating the incident, said it was due to a weed that was growing alongside the school called oh, stinkweed. Interesting. So they published a report called the Stinkweed Study, which I would encourage you to read. Sounds it's a page fascinating. Turner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but one of the things that's interesting about the Stinkweed Study, it talks a lot about stinkweed and mm. how this could possibly have sickened all these kids and sent them to the hospital. Um, and this is the State Department of Agriculture. Yes. Okay. Um, but at the end of it, it, it does actually give a log of all the pesticides that are sprayed on a regular basis mm. um, around Waimea Canyon Middle School. Just in like an appendix, they said. Yeah. Maybe this. In maybe addition to stinkweed. Yeah. <laughs> in it here. And that's fascinating. Mm. Because again, when you're talking about a school evacuation, you're talking about acute exposure. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of exposure that you can detect with your eyes, your nose. You might faint, you might vomit. And acute exposure is dangerous. Mm. It can lead to a lifelong set of impacts. Mm. Um, it can also kill you. But low-level daily exposure, right. you can't detect. You wouldn't know to pick up a phone. You wouldn't evacuate the school. It would just be on the surfaces and in the air and in the water. They've found chlorpyrifos in the water fountains at Waimea Canyon Middle School multiple times. The EPA just proposed banning chlorpyrifos. So chlorpyrifos, for those who don't know, not us. <laughs> oh, uh, no, 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 yes, we all here know exactly <laughs> what those are. Right. Yeah. 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 Is, is, is it class of insecticide <laughs> in organophosphate mm -hmm. um, that the seed companies use in Hawaii very regularly? We were just getting the numbers on how much they use. Mm -hmm. It's really alarming. We know it's being sprayed. Um, 
And we know that children are going to school right alongside where this is being sprayed. Mm. And the science on chlorpyrifos is really clear. Uh, it leads to neurological impacts in, in kids, ADHD, autism. It leads to asthma, right? So the science is really clear about that. We know that chronic exposure is the problem, and yet the seed companies are saying, no, the problem is stinkweed, mm. and that if you require us to tell us what you're spraying, you're going to destroy farming in Hawaii. Mm. Now, so I have a sneaking be suspicion. Good. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion that that might not actually happen. <laughs> you know? And I would just like the Department of Agriculture to take the recommendations of the Joint Fact Finding Committee, which mm. they spent $250,000 funding, mm. maybe take the recommendation of every single pediatrician um, that's testified publicly on the issue to, like, let's protect our keiki, right? Let's tell doctors what you're spraying and maybe. The other thing that the report recommended and we've been advocating for is buffer zones. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you're going to spray the bad stuff, don't do it in your schools. Seems like a compromise to me. Mm. Um, but the industry, again, is, is putting the full force of their marketing dollars, mm -hmm. which, not surprisingly, exceeds our own. They, they have some money. Um, to fight that. And actually to really misrepresent it. So, mm. it, you know, if, I, if anybody wants to do a quick Google on me, um, <laughs> you'll hear that I'm pretty anti-farmer. I wish I could Google it now. <laughs> yeah, that's Wait, where's where's, my, the last where's my Google machine? Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, okay, really fast right there. Well, which is interesting, when we had um, Monica Ivy on, Ooh. who's a PR yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, rep for Monsanto, we talked to her about, before she took this position, she was selling handbags, or was in like a designer like bag mm -hmm. and since taking on this role she's been you know her name's been kind of put out there she's been kind of ostracized and mm -hmm. harassed online and and similar similar to you it kind of sounds like you know being a public mm. person so it's it's just fascinating to kind of hear what does motivate you to like stay in this you could very yeah. easily fall into the, the background <laughs> yeah. yeah no it's and a I tougher don't... industry because like, yeah, I mean like we were talking before <laughs> about uh, you have went to this meeting uh, over on Molokai. I mean, there's been multiple meetings you go to, and I mean, there's people publicly yeah. coming after you. And yeah, I think that's a great thing that we want to hear about. Is like, how do you how do you put up with that? How's that how's that yeah. work? Yeah. You know, there's that like kind of uh, adage or something like, if they're going against you, you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the amount of ire that our movement has earned. It, not me, mm. the, the movement to regulate chemical companies. You know, I, I think that tells us that we're being effective. You know, why are the world's largest chemical companies, you know, paying people in Hawaii to attack a grassroots social movement that frankly isn't making radical demands? Mm -hmm. You know, we're not saying ban all GMOs ever. You know, some people are. Mm -hmm. And, like, we need them in the movement. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it, it tells us that we're being effective and that we're hitting on a much deeper structural issue. And I think for those who aren't very, aren't very interested in, like, GMO as a technology or even pesticides, mm -hmm. the other bigger question is, like, what is the future of our food system? Mm -hmm. And do we want a food system that's driven by large-scale multinational corporate interests? Mm -hmm. Or do we want a food system that's driven by the grit, tenacity, and creativity of local people, local businesses, and local farmers? Mm -hmm. And as somebody who comes out of this as a small business owner and like really tried to provide a niche set of services to people in Hawaii who wanted to live a better way, mm -hmm. I will tell you that I don't see a role for these mega corporations in a world where we're dealing with issues like climate change. Mm -hmm. They just do not have our environmental and public health interests at, at the front of their business. In fact, they're designed to put profit before people. Mm -hmm. And I know local business owners, I might be talking to some of them right now, and like local business owners make decisions based on the local values mm -hmm. and the local impact that they have. Mm -hmm. That to me is the future of food. It's local. It's not large-scale multinational corporations like Monsanto. If they're organic farming in Cunea, awesome. Great. I am not going to knock them 
or their public representatives. It's a waste of my time. But I do believe that we need to actively advance a food system that's locally owned. We have to. Mm -hmm. That's the future. It's not a future of Walmart meets Monsanto. You know? Mm -hmm. And so on that note, other work and recent accomplishments of the Center for Food Safety mm. is moving some organic tax rebate forward. Yeah. So you want to talk a little bit about that? We have about 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Yeah. I mean, basically, we want to offset the cost of being a certified organic farmer. We know when you're certified organic, people will pay a higher premium for your product. Um, and, and, so, and so this is a, a cost, though, for organic farmers to become certified organic. Right. There's a cost you have to pay annually to have that certification. Yeah, and yeah. this you can write off all of those costs. So any costs associated with uh, obtaining organic certification, the state of Hawaii will give you a credit up to, I think, $50,000 50, yeah. per farmer. Is that usually more than that? What's that? The, the cost? Yeah. It depends like on the scale of farm, but okay. no. Absolutely okay, so that covers not. it. Uh, yeah, because currently there's a, a federal tax credit for, or is that a state one as well? No, that's federal. Okay, no, and, and now there's a state one that gives yeah, you Yeah, it's a 100%. funding stream. Exactly. Okay. And then the idea is let's put our money where our mouth is. Like, I don't just want to advocate for the no. I want to actively add capacity to the yes. And I think organic is the future of farming. All right, we actually are out of time. So great. glad we get to end like on that. At least another 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank All you so right, much thanks. for coming on and sharing yeah. your story.